Thank you, Greg. And uh, it's risky putting me first. I'll try not to put the whole room to sleep here. But uh, no, I think this is the eighth year you've invited me back despite, uh, despite everything. So no, this is uh, actually one of my favorite groups to talk with. And uh, this, this topic especially. Um, Greg actually asked me to talk about the same thing a few years ago. So I appreciate that, Greg. But uh, a lot has actually changed, especially with biologics in the past few years. Um, so I'm going to go over the, as most of you know, the different biologics that have been approved for nasal polyps, um, and there are three different classes, so we'll go over that. And then uh, AERD, how to diagnose aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, and what options are available, like desensitization. Uh, so we'll go through all that and have a couple cases to get started, and uh, feel free to jump in at any point if questions come up. So. First, we'll go over biologics, and this has changed significantly. And I remember when Greg first invited me um, seven, eight years ago, that uh, we were just kind of go over and over case reports of the patients we have seen. You know, that that, that time we're on omalizumab, a biologic we've used for 20 years, and we were noticing, gosh, their sinus disease is improving. You know, but the past several years, there's been a, a significant jump in in the FDA approved products, obviously, and they all work very well, and they all work differently. Um, there's anti-IL-5s, and I'll go through each of these, and there's three biologics within that class that we use. Only one is approved at this point for nasal polyps, but that's going to change, I think, in the next few years. There's our oldest biologic, uh, which is anti-IgE or omalizumab. It originally came out for asthma, and frankly, we don't use it a ton for asthma now. We use it for chronic urticaria, and now we use it for nasal polyps, given it was approved a few years ago. And then the first one came out, I'm sure, Everyone in the room is a, a, knows about dupilumab, which is an anti-IL-4 or IL-13 blocker. And uh, each of these has roles. And um, you know, it, it's not one size fits all. Every patient is different. And I consider each of these biologics for the severe refractory sinus disease. And a lot of them has asthma, have asthma as well. So we use that in addition. So aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, we're all seeing these folks in our clinic. Um, and the diagnosis can frankly be tricky sometimes. So we're gonna, I'll go over the way we go about you know, diagnosing this condition and then what options are available just beyond the normal therapy. So we'll uh, have another case uh, halfway through to go through that. So actually, Greg, I think this is a case you and I saw about eight, nine years ago in clinic. We co-managed uh, nasal polyps and asthma and the, these patients all prevent, present very similarly. They all seem to come down with what they thought was a cold. They're doing fine. Before this, the patient had some mild allergies. They didn't bother him too much. Mild asthma. But yeah, five years ago, developed this cold-like symptoms and never really got over it. So nasal polyps. Um, has had two polypectomies. You all go in and do this beautiful job of cleaning them out. And I will say, seeing these patients and co-managing them all, they all kind of say the same thing. I forgot what it's like to feel normal. They're just so miserable with this condition, so they feel great. And this patient was on all the, uh, the right therapies, budesonide, doing it regularly, very compliant, but unfortunately those polyps keep coming back after six to 12 months. Asthma usually follows a patient have nasal polyps, um, and it can be anywhere from mild to severe, but we actually love when you all go clean out their polyps, because usually their asthma gets a lot better too. With nasal polyps especially, often the upper airway drives kind of the lower airway disease. So this patient was on all the standard therapy, high-dose ICS, lava therapy, Montelukast, teatropium, and was still having daily symptoms. So I'll give you guys a few seconds to memorize this. Um, <laughs> these are one of these confusograms, but just to kind of simplify things, usually there's an insult to the epithelium, and that can be a lot of different things, whether that's um, you know, infections, whether that's allergens, pollutants, et cetera, trauma. And they release these things called alarmins. Um, one of them is TSLP, and you'll be hearing about TSLP if you haven't already. We, just got that approved as a biologic for asthma, and I think there may be some news in the coming years with uh, sinus disease as well. IL-33 and IL-25 are also being studied, but in those who are predisposed, they go down what we call the TH2 pathway. A lot of you know about this. Produces IL-4, IL-5, IL-13. It's kind of the eosinophilic or allergic type pathway, and the majority of the polyps, at least in this part of the world, are mainly eosinophil driven. So increased IgE production, decreased eosinophilic inflammation, and that's kind of this area here. 
um, the TH2 type inflammation is where the, all these biologics, at least the ones that are currently approved, are focused. You have your IL-4 and IL-13 blocker, blocks the same receptor, that's dupilumab. You can block eosinophils, which is IL-5, which is very good at doing so. And then you can block IgE, which has effects beyond just being the quote unquote allergic antibody. So with these patients, and we'll go over the data, even with nasal polyps and those without you know, allergy or sensitivities on skin testing or blood testing, these patients also improve independent of that uh, mechanism. So we have a lot more therapies than we used to. Again, the IL-4, IL-13, dupilumab blocks you know, this uh, part of the inflammatory TH2 response. There's actually three anti-IL-5s. Uh, Mepolizumab is one that's approved for nasal polyps. But benrolizumab, they're studying that, and that may be approved. I think the FDA is still reviewing the data, but that may be another one that actually targets the receptor and not IL-5 itself. There's also reslizumab, which is a great medication, but it's only IV dose, so most patients, uh, we, we don't start, unless they're severe, because you can dose it weight-based. And then there's anti-IG. Again, that's our oldest uh, biologic. We've had that for 20 years for asthma. And um, we use it a ton for different conditions, including one called chronic urticaria that's not an allergic condition. So it has a mechanism beyond that of just treating the quote unquote allergic antibody. So those are the currently approved dupilumab, IL-4, IL-13, Mepo blocks IL-5, and then um, Zola, excuse me, omelizumab, uh, which blocks IgE. So as far as the, the first one that was approved, the dupilumab, um, IL-4, IL-13, they have a ton of different effects, but they're involved in mast cell proliferation and activation. They increase IgE production, um, increase eosinophil adhesion to the vascular um, uh, endothelium. And if you do follow this, if you start someone on Dupixin, say you get a CBC later, paradoxically, you'll probably note that their eosinophils increase. And we think that's just because they're not being recruited into the tissues as much. So if you do start someone on them, their eosinophils increase, that doesn't mean it's not working, but that is something we commonly see. Increased epithelial permeability. Um, so, this led to the first um, medium-sized study, and I'm gonna go over this for a couple reasons. And the big one is just to go over the study designs. A lot of you, I'm sure, have read these, but they're all kind of designed the same way, which each of the individual drugs, and they're kind of run by the same people. But um, nasal endoscopic nasal polyp scores are what they mainly go over. Um, and that's uh, zero to four on each side for a total of eight, and you guys, can probably tell me more about how you score those uh, than I could, but that's what they look at, and that's a primary endpoint in most of these studies. They also look at CT scores, not 22, upset, nasal PIF, a lot of different things, but all these studies are pretty much designed the same. Oh, no. And in this study, as you can see, after just 16 weeks of being on the uh, dupilumab, they had about a two-point drop, which is fairly significant in the nasal polyp scores. And I don't have a comparison slide with each of the biologics, but um, I will say, remember that too, because it drops at uh, about two in the nasal polyp scores. CT scores improved, symptoms improved on SNOT22. The upset, they all improved on this therapy, which led to the main trial that got this medication approved in the Lancet several years ago. And it's actually two studies. It's the sinus 24 and the sinus 52. The sinus 24 is pretty straightforward. It's a 24-week trial where it's active drug. Um, dupilumab 300Q2, which is wow, how we all start that medication versus placebo. The 52 is obviously a longer study, but they did something unique in this, in this study where in the active treatment group, after, halfway through, they put half of them continued on Q2 week dosing, whereas half went to Q4 week dosing. And I'll go over a slide looking at that data as well. And that has actually kind of changed the way I manage some of these patients. Again, the endpoints are the same in all these studies, with the biggest one being nasal polyp scores. Pretty large studies, 276 and 24, and the 448 and sinus 52. And 
baseline characteristics, they're pretty similar to what we're seeing in clinic. At least what we're seeing at UW, at, most of the patients coming to us have had several sinus surgeries, if not one, several, and have continued to experience symptoms despite you know, appropriate therapy afterwards. So about 75% of the people in this study had, um, had previous sinus surgery. Their eosinophils were on the higher end of normal, um, which is pretty average for what we see in these patients as well because it mainly a TH2 type response and about 30% had aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. So as you can see here, the nasal polyp scores in this one dropped about two. And again, remember that. And in this study, um, the 52, right here is where they switched from Q2 weak dosing to Q4 and half. And as you can see, it's pretty similar as far, there's some people that didn't have the same response, but I admit in my practice, and this is off-label, but for those who have been on Q2 weak dosing and done extremely well, no recurrence of the polyps, doing well clinically, sometimes I'll space it out to closer to every three or four weeks because the elephant in the room is how much these medications cost. So, um, you know, the nasal congestion, obstruction score, they all improved on this. And this was the trial that led to dupilumab being approved. It decreased polyp size, sinus opacification, and it got approved in uh, June of 2019. And I got to say, in our practice, we have a ton of patients on dupilumab, and most of them do improve significantly. But like I said, most of them have had previous sinus surgeries. So a lot of people don't make it to us who have sinus surgeries or on their appropriate topical therapies. So these are usually the most severe patients we're considering putting them on. The other reason that's also approved for asthma, like these other drugs. So if they have severe asthma, that's another reason we'll go to these. So again, our oldest biologic, uh, anti-IgE, omalizumab. Um, again, using this for so many years, we were seeing these patients in clinic. They were treating for other conditions like asthma or a chronic urticaria. We we're noticing their polyps were getting better. So, and that's independent of an allergic mechanism, which was somewhat surprising, but it has a lot of different effects. So it was designed the same way. Um, there's two trials, the polyp one and the polyp two, pretty straightforward. You know, not as many patients as the dupilumab, but still a good N in these studies. And they found pretty similar results that did meet the primary endpoint. Although, again, I don't have a summary slide on these because I think there is indications for each of these medications. But you can see it dropped the scores about one point as opposed to two in the dupilumab. But so the symptoms all improved similarly. So. Omalizumab is a good option for a lot of patients, and if I think a patient has a really significant allergic component, sometimes I'll put them on. Or if they have underlying chronic urticaria. So every patient is different in this regard, and that led to the approval of omalizumab in December of 2020, and we've had a lot of patients do very well on this as well in regards to their sinus symptoms. The final class is anti-IL-5, and IL-5 has a lot of different effects, but it mainly targets eosinophils. It's produced by those Th2 cells um, involved in terminal differentiation, mobilizes eosinophils, survival, cytotoxicity, and the anti-IL-5 agents are really good at decreasing eosinophils, at least peripherally, most of the time in the tissues. So again, there's three members of this class. Mepolizumab is the only FDA approved for nasal polyps at this point, but benrolizumab, which works slightly different, which targets the receptor, not IL-5 itself, may be approved in the coming years, and there may be a role for reslizumab, if, uh, although that will be farther away. Again, the big difference is that's dosed IV and for patient convenience, because they do need to receive this monthly. Most of the time, they're on the MEPO. So the big trial, again, the design is very similar with this. Um, the standard dose of 100 milligrams Q4 uh, versus placebo. These patients, like most of these trials, they have to have um, a score of five or greater, a nasal polyp score. And in this study, they had to have at least one sinus surgery in the past year. And again, that's pretty similar to the patients. Almost all of them have had sinus surgery and the polyps have come back. Again, polyp scores, nasal obstruction, and there was 407 uh, in this trial. So again, a reasonable N. And they found the same findings. It met the primary endpoint. But if you can remember, the nasal polyp um, scores for the dupilumab was about two. For omalizumab, it was one. And it was uh, 0.73 um, in, in this one. But again, it is significant. 
And if patients' eosinophils are through the roof, or if I think they have something like hyper-eosinophilic syndrome, if there's a question of churg strauss you know, this is oftentimes a very good option for those patients. And almost always before we start this, I talk to Ian and Greg, and, and we come up with a plan about what we think, which biologic we think would be most effective for this particular patient. So again, the sinus symptoms improved, and that was backed up by the data, and it was approved in July of 2021. Again, we treat severe eosinophilic asthma with this, so if there's that component, oftentimes that'll change how we you know, manage nasal polyps. I have actually a fair amount of patients I follow up with uh, hyper eosinophilic syndrome. A lot of these patients have nasal polyps and they've actually done really well. A few people in this room have done surgery on them as well and they've done really well on the uh, anti l 5 therapy. So again, that mainly targets eosinophils. So again, the, th the three that are approved are the dupilumab. That's dose 300 milligrams sub-Q every other week. And the nice part is you can actually start this at home as opposed to some of the other biologics like omalizumab that we do start in clinic because there's a, a real but very rare risk of an immediate reaction, which is, again, very, very rare. But oftentimes we'll start medications like omalizumab in the clinic and then transition. The anti-IL-5s, again, MEPO is approved, um, but benralizumab, I think there's a good chance maybe approved in the next few years, so we should have more that are coming down the road. And um, if any of you are interested, I can send you my talk with these citations if you want to review some of the data. I didn't have time to go through all of that. And as always, I'm going to run over, I think. Um, and then omalizumab, again, is a good option, but that's based on total IgE level and body weight. So case two. Um, Kind of similar presentation. Um, patient in her uh, 40s came in, severe nasal polyps, came, same kind of thing. And this patient, I remember, she said everyone around her was sick, but everyone got over it but her. And since that time, she was diagnosed with nasal polyps, same kind of history. You all go and clean her out. She feels great for a long period of time, but unfortunately, despite doing appropriate therapies, you know, the polyps come back. And Again, with nasal polyps, we love it when their, their polyps are controlled because oftentimes the asthma follows suit. This patient who had very mild asthma before nasal polyps, all of a sudden that improved, you know, worsened significantly despite ICS, lava therapy, kind of the standard. And I tell our fellows, every new asthmatic and certainly every new patient with nasal polyps, you need to ask about NSAID sensitivity. So this patient had taken ibuprofen and within about 30 minutes developed a severe asthma exacerbation. And these are the patients that will actually end up um, in, in being hospitalized because they come down with an illness, they have the underlying severe asthma, and then they take an NSAID and that just kind of tips them over the edge. A similar reaction took place with her a few years ago because she took Alka-Seltzer and didn't realize it had aspirin. So we all know the triad, it has about 47,000 names. Samter's triad, triad asthma, but we, in our field, we mainly use aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. And again, it's a class effect. It applies to all NSAIDs that inhibit COX-1. So if someone comes in and says, gosh, I had this reaction to aspirin, but I took 600 milligrams of ibuprofen a few days ago and I did just fine. The it's probably not AERD at that point. These patients usually present second to fourth decade. It's, again, it's usually upper and lower disease and NSAID sensitivity, um, specifically sinopulmonary reaction. So if someone comes in and says, I'm just having hives without any wheezing, nasal symptoms, sometimes I question that diagnosis. So again, it's any medication that inhibits COX-1. So these patients typically will tolerate um, Tylenol, they'll tolerate COX-2 inhibitors as well. But again, if someone says, I had a reaction to aspirin, but I take a bunch of ibuprofen, that's not the diagnosis. So it should be called NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease, but for obvious reason, that name hasn't taken off. Um, so but that's really what it should be called. And again, it's sinopulmonary reactions. If someone says, I just developed hives, I question the diagnosis, but you can see that. But most patients develop the nasal and asthma symptoms. Unfortunately, there's no good skin test, blood test to identify this. It comes down to the history. And because NSAID use is so common, most of the time from the history you can decide. But sometimes we do challenge them. That can be risky, especially if their asthma is severe. But the main reason to delineate is aspirin desensitization is potentially an option. And I don't have time to go through all the studies, but we've been using this for 30, 40 years now. We know it works, and all those studies are below, but 
decreases sinus symptoms, decreases need for surgeries, polypectomies, decreases asthma symptoms, hospitalizations, glucocorticoids. So we do know it worked. So again, you have to have you know, that sensitivity. If these patients aren't sensitive to NSAIDs, aspirin desensitization and subsequent high-dose aspirin usually aren't gonna be beneficial. So in an ideal world, and this Ian and Greg can know, it can be difficult to coordinate, but ideally we have them surgically cleaned out about four to eight weeks prior and then do that. Not only does it improve the outcomes afterwards, but it makes the desensitization a lot easier. So we use a Scripps protocol, and I'm running over time, so I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but we use nasal Toradol every half hour, and then go to aspirin. So it's a long first day, so they're there for eight to, eight to nine hours. And actually, you send them home at the end of the day. By definition, this has to happen within three hours. So they're good. Once they get through the first day, they come back the second day. Usually they do pretty well. Once they react, we treat it, they get through it. Um, they, uh, Hey, take that uh, 325 uh, milligram dose, and actually we send them home on 650 milligrams twice a day. Sounds high, but it's usually well tolerated, and we know they need at least 325 twice a day to, to uh, um, treat the polyps. Again, the drawbacks, some people develop gastritis. It's rare, but we've had to take a few people off, and we'll even try and send them to uh, GI. One patient had epistaxis, they went to urgent care, they told him to stop it for a week, we couldn't restart it because you can only miss about three days, you have to go through that desensitization. Or if they have an upcoming surgery or they're planning on getting pregnant very soon, oftentimes we'll wait. And they need to take it consistently. You have to have a motivated patient, although most of these patients are very motivated because if they miss more than two or three days, you have to go through the whole desensitization again. So again, for patients with nasal polyps, asthma, and specifically if they have that NSAID sensitivity component, they may be a candidate for aspirin desensitization. So in summary, and I'm way over here, um, the biologics, three classes, and I think there's gonna be more coming out in the next few years, but dupilumab as far as the anti-L413, MEPO and the anti-L5, specifically targeting eosinophils, Anti-IgE, which goes after IgE, the allergic antibody, but it has effects well beyond just targeting the allergy component. And again, uh, for those with aspirin sensitivity or NSAID sensitivity, I should say, consider referral for aspirin desensitization. Now, I, I will say we haven't done a lot of these in the past few years just because of COVID initially, and then we lost a few nurses, and it does take one-on-one -on -one nursing to do this. So there are a few centers that we should have this program up and running here in the next few months. But, but yeah, there are a few places, you know, a few allergists in the area that will, will perform this. So consider that um, for these patients. All right. All right, thank you, Dr. Ayers. Mm -hmm. uh, we, all the faculty will still be here. We have time for one question as Dr. O'Brien is setting up. Yes. So real, real quick, if you don't mind. Um, so I've had some allergists be a little reluctant to the aspirin desensitization now that biologics aren't an option. For patients with AER, do you typically try and do both if possible or? No, that's a great question. And we're, we actually had a pro and con debate at our national meeting a few weeks ago, but there's a role for each. Obviously, the, the pros of the biologics is you can get them started right away. They don't have to go through this procedure, which does have some risks. Um, again, the elephant in the room is these are not cheap medications. And as you saw, that when we take them off, it's not a disease-modifying thing. So they have to be on that long term. And there are obviously a lot of costs associated with that. Other than the initial aspirin desensitization, obviously aspirin is very cheap, and they usually do very well. So it, it, it's a great question, and I don't have a good answer, and everyone's different. With us, it's been kind of easy because we haven't been able to do aspirin desensitization, but we're getting it up and running. So when that comes up, I have a conversation with the patients. What would you prefer? And I go over the costs associated with biologics and the safety profile, which all of them are very safe. But you know, I also offer them aspirin desensitization because long term, you know, it is a lot cheaper for the patient. So there are pros and cons to each, and we're still teasing that out. So bottom line is I don't have a good answer for that at this point, but hopefully as the years come, you know, we'll, we'll have a more standardized approach to that, so. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. All right, uh, and now I get the pleasure of introducing.